uh, much like my friend Todd Lockwood, this gentleman has been doing illustrations for years and years and I won't say too many years, but he's done it for a while. Uh, we were fortunate enough they both now live in the greater Seattle area and both of them, while still producing some really brilliant artwork, as you might have noticed the art book from 2013, wanted to try new challenges and Braum has been writing his own novels for now, what, the better part of a decade, I guess. Because uh, this is the fourth one, right? It's the fifth one. Fifth one. Oh, okay. Um, and they all, well, you know, and uh, interesting enough, they, they all sort of stand alone. He hasn't been writing an ongoing saga of 17 books, thank God. Um, <laughs> people currently ask me sometimes why I haven't read certain books. I'm like, because that's only book two is out. I'm waiting to see if it's going to be three or when they're going to write book three. Or, like in the case of Brent, his trilogy is now, Brent's going to be here for book four, what's going to be a quintet? And there better only be five books or I'm going to kill him. <laughs> Brom is here for his new novel, Lost Gods, in which case, for those of you who haven't read it yet, since it officially goes on sale tomorrow, we won't give away too many spoilers, except to say that uh, at least one of the main characters is this young gentleman named Chet, who's had kind of a messed up life, and without saying too much of the plot, it doesn't go so well in the first few chapters, and he finds himself more or less in purgatory, trying to kind of fix things, at least if not for himself, for his, uh, his family. Without further ado, please welcome Brom. Can I just talk loudly, if that works? Okay. As long as they can all hear us, so, as long as you stay close to the mats, I might say. Is, this is your mic back here? Yep, you're okay. Fine. This is a little intimidating, right, in my yeah, face come, there. there go. Um, hello. Um, thank you very much for coming out to see me on this rainy Seattle evening. I appreciate it. Um, I don't really have a, an official talk put together, but what I'll do is I'll talk briefly about how I got into writing, touch on a few of my books. And what's most fun for me is just to go into a question and, and answer. So anything you guys want to ask about illustration, about writing, um, please do. And uh, you know, often I get a shy crowd, so don't be shy. Just uh, anything that you want to ask, uh, it helps move things along. Um, OK, so I've always considered myself uh, a storyteller with pictures, with words. As a child, um, I used to take my crayons and my color paper and, and draw little pictures and words and staple them together and make my books. And I feel very fortunate all these years later to still be doing that. I just now use a computer and. Uh, and uh, I paint on canvas. Uh, I'm a traditional painter for the most part, on um, oils. Um, primarily, I got started in illustration. Um, I've had, uh, I guess, 30 years now of professional illustration. This book is full of paintings. Uh, I've worked in many facets of the genre, in, in fantasy, horror, science fiction. Uh, I got my big break working for TSR, a gaming company that does Dungeons and Dragons. Um, for many years, I worked off and on in different facets, whether it was doing uh, concept designs for, for films or games, uh, book covers, um, just a little of everything. And I found in my late 30s, a lot of my work was getting repetitive. Uh, uh, people were often asking me to do, sort of repeat paintings I had done previously, so I was feeling a little stagnated. And it even got to the point where I was a little reluctant to go to the painting board. For the first time in my life, I was actually not enjoying painting. And I needed something to kind of get that going again. Um, and uh, I don't, like I mentioned, I'd always like to tell stories. So I said, well, maybe if I write a few short stories, I can do some illustrations with them and, and get that going. And I started writing some short stories. And uh, I loved it. Uh, the, my obsessive creative nature, most creatives are obsessive. We need to make things. Um, and uh, I started out writing a few short stories uh, with um, prose, one page, illustration, the other. And then at some point, the, uh, or the writer in me wanted to know if I could write a novel that stood on its own with prose. So since then, I've written three novels. But uh, I'll step back. And uh, my first novel, uh, I don't have it up here, was The Plucker. And The Plucker was, uh, I th it's interesting how we write by things that, uh, oh, you have a copy right here. <laughs> That's handy. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> is the plucker, um, how we're inspired by the things around us. Our, my children were young then, and I was reading them uh, lots of children's book, uh, the Velveteen Rabbit, Winnie the Pooh, Raggedy Ann, um, The Tin Soldier, all these wonderful stories where toys come to life in the world of imagination. And uh, I found out there's, there's two 
mythologies that all children share. It's very universal. And one is that, that they believe that their toys come to life, they're, they come to life in their imagination, and that they're real. And the other one is monsters under the bed. So um, as writers, you're often interested in conflict. So there was obvious conflict. What happens if these monsters come crawling out from under the bed? How would these toys deal with that? And what's interesting to me is telling things in a, a visceral, gritty way, like what would it really be like to be a toy and to you know, have to fight and defend your child, um, you know, to have the stuffing torn out of your body, this, this kind of thing that makes it very adult. Uh, it wasn't the easiest book to sell to publishers. <laughs> they, they kept going, well, we like that story, but can you make it a, you know, a little nicer for children? And it's like, no, that's what's interesting to me is it's not for children. It's a children's book for adults. So that was the first one. I uh, had a blast doing that. The second book that uh, I started working on is The Devil's Rose, and it's uh, sort of a romantic western set in hell. Uh, the, the funny thing that, that inspired me this uh, is uh, my, my honeymoon was one of the inspirations for this book, um, which is a funny thing to say. Uh, my wife and I were living in Atlanta at the time. We got married, and we went on what I call our white trash honeymoon. We went to Gatlinburg, Tennessee. And um, the, the, the whole thing was a catastrophe. Our brakes went out in the mountains. We ended up in this small town getting, losing money to a mechanic that was report, repairing our brakes. But we were in this really crappy little hotel. It had a vibrating bed that just screeched. And my, my wife had a migraine, so uh, not the best honeymoon. But the next day, we were at a Stuckey's, and Stuckey's is kind of a souvenir joint. And outside of it, there was a motorcycle. And the motorcycle had a stuffed horse head on the front of it, a real store stuffed horse head. And I got a picture of it. I never know who knew who rode this, but I always, in my mind, I always wondered who would ride that motorcycle. And it sort of inspired this character. And uh, the character, uh, this book follows um, essentially a character that uh, is a bounty hunter for, for, the, for Lucifer. And uh, he's a, um, a Texas ranger, and he tracks down escaped souls. So. Um, and this was, uh, again, this was lots, lots of illustrations, pretty much a painting in prose on each page. So it was after this book that I was really wanting to know, well, um, can my prose stand on its own? So the next book I started to write was The Child Thief. And the Child Thief is based on um, the Peter Pan myth. And what fascinated me about Peter Pan, when you read P uh, Barry's Peter Pan, is beneath that lyrical prose is a very very gritty, dark story. It's, it's essentially a, a psychotic, um, psychopath, um, charisma, charismatic psychopath leading children on a path to, to teaching them how to kill and murder. Um, there's parts in that book, again, if you, if you look under the lyrical prose where they're having a, a body count contest at one point, who can kill the most pirates, um, there was a, a line in it that inspired this book, and it was, I won't get this right, but essentially it is, um, uh, when the children grow up, which is against the rules, Peter Pan thins them out. So I said, whoa, what does that mean? So it got me thinking, <laughs> what would it be like if, if you were a child and Peter Pan really brought you to this island and you know, gave you weapons and, and let's learn to, to fight and, and, and kill people? And once again, it's that, that, that gritty, visceral, uh, I guess what's interesting to me is to try to make that as gritty and visceral as possible to feel what that might be like. Um, so that was the first written novel, and the second one uh, is my favorite book I've written. It's Krampus the Yule Lord, and uh, I didn't know who Krampus was until, uh, how should I say this, about six or seven years ago my wife started bringing home these wonderful postcards with Krampus on it, and Krampus was very popular in the turn of last century, um, and he's essentially on face value, this Christmas demon who captures naughty children, puts them in a sack, and, and beats them. Um, if they're really naughty, he throws them in a lake, and if they're really, really na naughty, he takes them back to the cave and cooks them and eats them. So, uh, so what was there not to love about Krampus? Um, but I started doing some digging. I said, this is an intriguing character. And when I really started looking into Krampus, uh, I've traced him back. His roots come from the early Yule traditions. The, the Yule Goat was one of the first of these winter solstice type traditions, and he evolved out of that, as did Santa Claus. So Krampus actually predates Santa Claus. And that got me thinking, if Krampus was to come back to this day and age, wouldn't he want to reclaim his holiday? And so the story was, he's tracking down Santa Claus to kill Santa and reclaim his holiday and bring it back to his pagan roots. 
And again, it sounds very funny, and it's that dark humor, but it's told, again, in a very, very realistic way. Which brings us to uh, the latest one, Lost Gods, yay. Um, this is, today's the first day I've, I've got to hold this book, so it's, it's interesting that these things aren't quite real in, until you have them in your hand. And we're in such a digital age, and I write this stuff digitally, and I paint them, and I put the paintings into the computer. So nothing to me, I guess I'm old school. Nothing seems real to me until I can hold it in my hands. So, uh, so yeah, so it's very exciting for me to finally be able to hold this and present this to you. Um, so again, these stories, to me, I, what I find interesting with authors is, is what sent them on the path to write that book. With this book, two things. It's essentially a man's journey into purgatory to, to find his grandfather. And uh, the two things that, that got me started writing this is one of my problems with ghost movies and ghost stories and ghost horror stories is we have a ghost haunting people and the ghosts kill people. And then it goes on and kills the next people. But, but I always stop and go, but wait, when, when the ghost killed that person, didn't that person turn into a ghost? You know, and then can't that ghost beat up that other ghost? You know, it seems like, <laughs> so what's going on there that I'm missing? So this taps into some of that. Once, once certain spirits kill Chet, and that happens right up front, so it's not like I'm giving anything away here, how Chet deals with this whole supernatural other world. And the other part of this that's fascinating to me, as with all my books, I love tapping into mythology. And... Um, you know, all religions and mythologies and their gods have their purgatories and their underworlds. And I figured, uh, I always kind of have this concept that these are all kind of powered by belief. So I figured if all these souls believe in these things in purgatory, it must be a very chaotic environment because there must be remnants of all these different ancient gods down there. Um, and so that's where the setting of this takes place is our, our Chet as he travels through the underworld, as he deals with this chaos of these these lost gods, these remnants of these gods trying to survive, trying to hold on to, to what they once were and their believers, and that coming in conflict with modern um, thoughts, whether you know it's, it's the one gods, the Christians and Hindus and so forth, or if it's just you know, um, you know, the, the, the atheists that don't believe in gods, and these people all end up in purgatory. So that's what um, got me writing this, had a lot of fun writing this, so I'm, I'm hoping people will enjoy reading it as well. Oh, and I should add that, um, as with most of my novels, uh, plenty of illustrations of the main characters and uh, black and white illustrations all through it. So that pretty much wraps up my presentation. Uh, so at this point, I would love to have some questions if anybody has any. So why is it red on the cover? Is he more photogenic than Chet? Is, why is, why, oh, why is the char this character on the cover? Yeah. It, you know, it's funny because the main characters, uh, Chet is not illustrated. To me, what's more interesting, the human beings, I feel like we know what they look like. To me, I'm interested in painting the monsters and the creatures and the gods because I don't know <coughs> what they look like. And those where I get to use my imagination and bring them life. I also find, as a reader, I like to visualize characters the way that they're interesting to me or pleasing to me or how I relate to them. So sometimes when I see a painting of a, of a main important character, it, it takes a little bit away from it. Yes? So since this is your third full novel, it is, um, yes. what do you think that you've, what experience have you gained the most out of writing this one from the first one? Um, so the, what I've discovered, much like painting, some paintings they fall into place and you just get so full of yourself. I'm such a talented painter. And then the next one is such a struggle and it's very difficult and you go, oh, I'm a fraud and everybody's going to see it. Um, it was interesting with the books, uh, The Child Thief, the first full novel, um, when I shopped that novel, I got a lot of rejections because my first attempt at writing it was not very good. And I had an editor, Diana Gill, that spent a lot of time working with me and helping me. And, and that that whole process, I learned a lot. And when I went to write my second book, Krampus, this book just fell into place. It was the characters, everything just seemed to almost write themselves. And after I wrote this book, I just thought, oh, this is easy, it's fun. Um, and so I went to write The Lost Gods, and it was, um, it, it got way too big for me. Um, what I've discovered is when I got into purgatory, I'm somebody that, I like for my magics to make sense. I don't like stories 
where somebody gets in trouble and they just pull out this magic spell and, and they get out of jail free, so to speak. So I, I like for there to be a logic. Um, and when I was in purgatory, I realized suddenly there, there's a lot of questions I have to, to make, make some sort of sense. You know, what happens when you die when you're already dead? You know, what, what mo monetary system drives souls to continue on? What, what makes, you know, these people want to continue when they're in the realm of the dead? So, um, so I, I learned maybe in my next book I won't create a whole universe, invent the whole universe. Uh, but it was fun. It was fun. And it was a world that ties very much into my own beliefs in a way. Um, I'm very superstitious. I believe in all religions because <laughs> I'm scared of all of them. I think they're all going to get me. Um, I, I, somebody tells me there's a werewolf in the woods and I believe it all. So, um, so it was kind of a, a cathartic for me to put a lot of that down there. Yes. Is there a graphic novel in your future? You know, it's part of the reason I started doing these illustrated novels is because I'm a failed graphic novelist. I originally wanted to tell stories through graphic novels and comics. And, um, you know, I wanted every picture, every panel to be a finished painting. And obviously that would take far too long. And it was, it, was, it was not a very productive way to tell a story for me. So I shifted more into writing. So no. Um, not for me, you know. There is the possibility that one of these, would, you know, we would license it into a graphic novel, and uh, I would help steer that ship. But we'd probably need somebody else to to lay out the panels. Yeah. Yes. So are you working on your next novel already, or are you taking a break? After every novel, I'm like, I'm never going to write another book. You know, it's um, and it's one of the beauties. I feel very fortunate by being an illustrator and a writer. Is um, when. I find when I do too much of any one thing, I start to, to start to get a bit creatively stagnated. I want to do different things. It keeps the creative energy going. So when I do too many paintings, I can't wait to get back to writing. And after I've written a book, I find I need like a year to clear my head. And, uh, and then the little stories start to develop and, um, and you start tapping away. Yeah. So, so yeah, hopefully there will be another book, but it uh, might be a year or two before I admit that. Do you have a favorite god? Do I have a favorite god in this mm -hmm. book? Which one was the most fun? Uh, well, the bad ones are always the most fun. Because <laughs> they get to do all the things that you're not supposed to do. But, uh, um, actually, there's a, there's a, a sort of a, a neutral, I wouldn't say neutral, she's sort of chaotic, chaotic good. Um, she's a spider goddess, and she's not afraid to do bad things if it serves her purposes. She was a lot of fun to write. Yeah. Do you have a name? Yiva Bog. I made that up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Any other questions? Oh, over here, yes. Uh, so while you were writing this, did you find anything that you were reading was particularly inspiring for this, or was it kind of like more fully formed and really influenced by anything? Um, it's not any, any, not any particular story or literature. Um, I think it was more just, uh, just how you know the the spiritual realm and and the afterlife. My personal thoughts and beliefs on that were, were just trying to put that all together in in a book form. That's where that came from. Yeah. Yes. I'm really glad you picked that cover because that one, when you voted on it or put the thing on yeah, it, yeah. I was like, oh my gosh, I love that one the most. I love both of them, but yeah. I thought that would fit more. Thank you. Yeah, we had a, it was a choice between this cover and what's on the back cover. Oh. Um, and uh, I like both the pieces as well, but I feel this more captures the book. And uh, <clears throat> so I'm glad you like it. Thank you. And there's a question back there. I was just curious about your, um, your your artistic style. How did you sort of like develop as an artist, and how do you keep on being creative, and how have you grown over time, and who's influenced you to be a, a great artist? Oh, well, you know, there's um, it's it's interesting. I, art is often a time and a place. It's 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 just you know, the events around you, the influences of that time inspire the art you're doing at the time, and and some things hold up. You know, it, it's kind of like Facebook. You you're, you're 
your thoughts get documented and some of them hold up 10 years later and some of them you're, you're, you really wish you hadn't put out there for the world to see. <laughs> so, uh, but early on it was, you know, I read a lot of literature and it was a lot of the covers of that, the Frazetta covers, whether it was Conan um, with Frazetta's Conan or Burroughs, um, the Tolkien books. Uh, Elric was a big influence, is sort of that um, tragic gothic character was before its time, even before Anne Rice. Um, if, if I had to sum up my two primary influence, it would be Frazetta, Norman, Rockwell, which is odd, they're kind of on different <laughs> of the spectrum, but, but Rockwell's craftsmanship and his, his, the way he makes things so believable, I love putting that element into fantastic, the things that aren't real, and, and making it a bit more believable. Um, currently, you know, it's as artists, we're, we're, it, it's funny, you're always reaching for that thing that's just out of reach. You, you have this vision that you're trying to achieve. So every time I finish a painting, I'm a bit disappointed because it's never what I had in my head. And I put it in a, way, in a closet and I can come to it six months later and I can look at it fresh. I don't come to it with any prejudice and I usually can enjoy my work better later. But um, to answer your question, I'm always looking for that that next piece that's going to somehow be the, 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 the piece I've been searching my whole life for, and once I achieve it, I can quit. But <laughs> it never seems to happen. Did you have any formal training uh, artistically? What is your background in that regard? Um, Self-taught. Uh, I was an army brat, so we traveled all over the world, actually. And um, art was always a wonderful way to be accepted with, with other kids when you went into different schools. Um, but I surrounded myself with art I liked. And even as a kid, you know, with Rosetta over there or any artist that I happened to like, it was always, why is my drawing or my painting not looking like that? You know, and with each one, you would get a little closer, you know, and, and when you're young, that learning curve's like this. So it's very exciting. Um, I never had the, the opportunity to have any formal art training. I was fortunate when I worked, first started on staff at TSR that there were a handful of professionals there that I got to look over their shoulders and just even learn the basics. How do you gesso a board? What paints? How do you mix your mediums? Um, so that was a big help. Uh, but uh, I think one of the benefits, uh, I don't recommend, I mean, one of the benefits of being self-taught is you, you become very uh, focused on, <laughs> very focused on self-critiquing your work, which can also result in a lot of dissatisfaction with your work because I have a hard time hanging my work in my house because I can't look at it and enjoy it. I'm always looking at it going, how could I imp you know, improve that? How could that have been a better painting? Back here, yeah. What's your writing pro uh, process like? Well, my writing process, it's, uh, you know, I've, it's a little different for each book, but um, essentially, there's some core ingredient that's interesting to me, something I want to get in there. And I usually know kind of where I'm starting and where I'm hoping to end up and a couple points I want to hit along the way. And I start off, but every time I've learned enough now, know that where I start and where I end up changes over time because as you learn who the characters are and you find your story, um, it changes. And, and with each of these books, it was that first draft is just that, it's finding the story. Um, so I've learned that writing is, you know, is a lot of rewriting. It's, you have to be very comfortable with throwing out chunks of your book if, if it's important to make the story better. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll try to outline in, in the hopes that that will save me from not throwing out as much. But if I outline too much, it becomes a bit too plot driven. And there's always these wonderful things that when the characters start to take on a life of their own and they do things that you wouldn't predict and that's the best magic because that's when it feels real and, and I think it also comes across that way to the reader. So I, I guess I, I cross my fingers and hope for you know, my, my characters to help me out. Yeah. All right, yep. Do you always use models or do you sometimes just use different references for your paintings? Um, so for the illustration, he wouldn't know if I always use models. Um, it's it's a mix. You know, I, I obviously do a lot of monsters and creatures, and uh, I paint those out of imagination. Uh, when I can paint out of imagination, that's the most interesting and exciting for me. But I also want things to be realistic and believable, so I gather all the reference I can 
Um, even if it's a monster, you know, you, animal anatomy, if I can understand the structure of the things I'm painting, they it tends to be a much smoother process. So it's usually a combination. Um, yeah, that's part of the process I like. I usually have a rough concept, and when I'm developing that concept of the story, I like to sketch a lot of the characters. It helps me kind of visualize who the characters are and, and kind of get a, a feel of a tone of the story. And uh, it's part something that I have found interesting is how I almost feel like two people, the writer and the illustrator, and the fact that they... Um, you know, they feed on each other. Uh, I'll do some of the drawings and I'll go to write those characters into the books and I discover things about them when I write them and I put those back into illustration and then as I develop the illustration I will discover things about the characters in the illustration and that goes into the writing. So it almost feels like two creative entities working together. Um, yeah. Which also is great because you can talk to each other and it's not really considered crazy because you <laughs> maybe. <laughs> yes? How did you pick the setting for Krampus? Because he's Norse, so why not put him in Norway instead of the U.S.? Um, so, uh, as, as a writer, to me, I, I like things that have create conflict or things that are interesting. So, Krampus, being a Norse, um, from Norse mythology, uh, I sent it in, set it in Boone County, West Virginia. Um, and it just seemed funny to me. And it immediately set that additional layer of, of contrast. Not only was Krampus dealing with modern society, but he was dealing with a culture that was very different from where he came from. Um, uh, I'm, I'm from, a lot of my relatives are from the south and from very rural communities, so there was a lot of that that I got to put in there that I enjoy and appreciate that culture, so, yeah. You said that you know, sort of, it goes between like book projects and new directions of art. And I know you, you were talking on one fantastic week about like maybe some of the stuff that you're going in might be a little like a different direction or experimental or something. Is there anything you can tell us about works that you're currently doing? Yeah. So I've I've set aside a year to uh, one of the things I've learned, no matter where I am in my career, is to 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 try to experiment. That's how you you move forward, even if it's as crazy as I'm a professional illustrator and I'm going to try to write, you know, it's just that doing something completely different creatively helps spark and, and feed that flame. Um, so I've finished up this book and I've set aside a year, um, you know, I love illustration and I've done 30 years of illustration for my own books for other projects, but what I've never allowed myself to do is just do paintings for the sake of the paintings, not since I was like 16 years old. So I'm curious to what will what that will be, and I've set aside a year, maybe a year and a half, to just do a series of paintings that kind of go where the painting take them. Um, and I shouldn't admit this, but uh, when I first did that, and, and I set aside my first month, and I got there, I cleared my schedule, and I was, you know, very excited. Here I go, and I didn't know what to do with myself. You know, it was just like uh, one of the wonderful things about illustration is is you. You know, affinity is narrowed down, and um, you okay. I need to do a, a mythological creature with wings, and it and it makes it easier to focus. But when you can do anything, it's it's affinity. Um, so it takes a, a sort of a different type. It it was not from a lack of ideas. It was too many ideas. It's just like and and it was constantly. I'd start here, and I'd say, oh, that's pretty. I want to do that. Oh, that's cool. You know, and uh, so I was trying to make myself figure out what I didn't want to paint. I started just Xing things off, and, and I feel now I, I'm on a path, and it, and it ties in a bit to what I've been doing, you know, mythological and supernatural, and that's all stuff that interests me. It's still dark, but uh, hopefully the paintings will have a bit more of an emotional quality to them, and, um, and as, as opposed to just illustration. I love illustration, but it's a slightly different goal with the art. You know. Ah, back here. Um, 
Well, the, the paintings I've been doing with books are definitely more character driven because they're, they're for that. Um, you know, I, I, I feel the art is always evolving. Um, I'm, I'm hoping it's evolving in a good way. It's hard for me, myself, to maybe think, to tell you exactly in what way, but um, uh, yeah. I don't know how to answer that question. <laughs> I'm, well, you guys have been great. You know, sometimes you get a crowd and nobody will ask a question, so everybody just kind of stares at the ceiling for a few minutes. But uh, this has been wonderful. Um, thank you so much for coming out. What we're going to do afterwards is we're going to get over here, we'll do, and we'll sign uh, books up and stuff. But I think I saw one more question before we close. Oh, I was going to ask if your wife ever helps you with your paintings. Like, I mean, I mean, not just helps you with ideas, but yeah. actually helps you figure well, out. Actually, hands on. Um, for those that don't know, um, my wife who's here, Lori Lee Brom, um, she's also an illustrator and a painter, and uh, she does fine art and surrealism. And uh, we have uh, connecting studios. Uh, we have a, a, a wall with a soundproof wall with a big door because she says I jibber jabber too much. <laughs> but um, we, we, we're definitely a big influence on each other and, and, and helping each other with the paintings. But to the date, we've never hands on on either painting. Um, I've tried with her to try to, to help her, and she will break my fingers if I <laughs> near her painting. So, uh, yeah, it's funny. Oh, you want to wrap it up? All right. Great. Okay. Um, anyway, thanks again for coming out, and we'll get over here and sign any books you guys want signed up.